Um, so I got involved with, with photography through skateboarding. That is me in 1986. Um, and my mom forced me to go to a community center basic photo class. And once I did that, I was hooked. Took pictures of skateboarding and punk rock music. Through skateboarding in the 1980s, you had to build your own skate park. All of us were 13 to 15 years old and we would build things like this. And through that, um, once I was properly educated in photography and learned about view cameras, um, I used these skills to make a very basic view camera myself. So this is, uh, it makes a negative that is seven inches by 17 inches. It's a negative is this big. Fast forward many years, I used that camera to make night photographs. Uh, in 2003, camping in the state of Utah in the United States, uh, a few of my friends finished a bottle and myself finished a bottle of whiskey. And I did not wake up in the mo before morning to close the shutter and something happened that changed my life. I woke up around nine in the morning. The sun had risen. Uh, and this is what happened inside the camera. This is the actual piece of film that was in the camera and the sun rose through the atmosphere I was very high elevation and the sun was very intense and it was very hot and it burned its path into the film. And then uh, it also got so overexposed, it did this thing called solarization where it turns into a positive image through extreme overexposure. Being a photographer, I had a piece of film. So you make a print from that piece of film. And so this is what I ended up with. And the film that had turned into a positive image when I made the print became a negative image. And the immediacy of the sun's burning through the film was lost by making the print. For three years, I made these and was very frustrated. I happened to have a bit of the history of photographic paper in my studio. And so I started to put that paper into view cameras. So this is uh, the Pacific Ocean. And I was able to get the water to look like a positive image. This is a very early attempt. More experimentation uh, and I started investigating lenses that would bring more light in. So talking about optics, I learned about aerial reconnaissance cameras. The object in the background is a aerial reconnaissance camera from the Korean War era about and that's the lens that came out of that. Using these lenses, they're bigger and more light from the sun comes in and you get this. Uh, and so what I'm doing here is this is a sun rising and I'm just taking the lens cap off for about 45 seconds and then putting it back and waiting a moment of time then taking it off and slowly expanding the time I take the lens cap off. These lenses burn so aggressively, I was able to get that uh, immediacy of the sun coming. Something that doesn't happen with photography, uh, my subject is coming into the camera and creating it and destroying it at the same time.
because it burns so much, I have to do things that I never thought I'd ever do, need to do in photography. Uh, the camera fills with smoke. So I have to vent the smoke out of the camera. Otherwise it's like photographing through fog. Um, and so from there, I got some bigger sheets of paper, old paper that would do the solarization and turn into a positive. So I, I felt it was time to make bigger cameras. And um, I've always loved the history of photography. And think about this. Crazy. even crazier. So anything I do won't be that, they had it much harder. Um, at the time, I lived in a little apartment downtown San Francisco. This was my wood shop, the living, the, the house. Since the camera was gonna be so big, there's no tripod I could carry, so I built it on a wagon meant for the garden. And then I made bigger cameras. This one is from a U2 spy plane. I went too big. It's too big of a lens. It has to sit on a wheelchair. Um, the camera on this side, this one makes 30 inch by 40 inch negatives. and. Uh, if I, because my negatives are from the camera are going on the wall, if I want a bigger image, I have to make a bigger camera. There's no enlarging. It's what's from the camera onto the wall. This is a very large piece. This is from that 30 by 40 camera. Uh, in the winter, the full day. Which brings me to seasons and where you are on the planet because I, d I cannot control my subject the sun I must follow um, and and so it took a little learning but I've, le I've learned this so this is winter San Francisco this is summer San Francisco summer different trajectories and then you think about the earth it goes straight up at the equator it feels insane to go all the way to the equator with these cameras so I can make a line on a piece of paper that goes that way. And what's funny is when I went there to make the picture the first night and I looked at, I went into a dark room to look at the piece of paper, I was surprised it was a straight line. It was still exciting. So that's the equator. You can drive from San Francisco all the way to the top of Alaska. I needed to change vehicles that could handle that big 30 by 40 camera and those sheets of paper. And so this is the van. I got a van. Um, and I'm keeping the tradition of the photographic van. So Alaska, once you get into the Arctic Circle, uh, the trees go away, and you have this very um, primal landscape full of grizzly bears. Um, and you'll notice it's, it's cloudy and snowy, uh, so you spend a lot of time inside the van while you wait for the sun. We also bring whiskey for, when, <laughs> for those week-long snowstorms that you just sit waiting. But when the sun comes out, you get to work.
This is the last mountain range before it just turns into tundra, uh, where the land, this is the last mountains before the land is just these low hills. I wanted to make a photograph here where the sun wouldn't set, but it interacts with the landscape. So this is, uh, we didn't bring enough food, but the first year I went, this is, I was able to get what's called the midnight sun. So the very center is midnight. Uh, that was the first year. When I left, I knew I needed to come back the next year with more food so I could get this. So this is 24 hours of daylight of me slowly going in a circle following the sun. So, so again, midnight and then that's uh, noon. And I, I, I love that sine wave form. I wanted to continue that line after 24 hours. I made another camera. Each panel is one foot by 40 inches. So this is a 25 foot long and it has, it's, it starts over there and you get midnight. There's a rainstorm and you can see rain got in the camera. There's some drips. And then uh, I got another midnight and then I, I ran out of paper. This is what it looks like in person. I always have to be, remind myself that these are, this big piece is made from camera negatives. So it, it's just to have something so large. Which brings us to circuit camera. Uh, it's the first panoramic camera made and it would use a 10 inch roll of film that would be 20 feet long. And I, I knew about these cameras and I thought maybe I could use that style camera in Alaska. So this is what a, cam a circuit camera looks like and how it functions. So, I wanted to use it because it could go in a circle without um, any lines. It would be unbroken. But it needed lots of modifications to do that. I was lucky enough to do a residency uh, in North Carolina, and these astronomy students worked with me uh, to convert the wind-up motor to an electric motor. And of course, this, the first time I used it up there, it got snowed on. Here, it, it took a little finessing, but I can s speed the motor so it tracks the sun in Alaska. And you get pieces like this without end. You can see this and this are the same. Also the way this exposes the paper, it records weather in a very unusual way. I was lucky enough to have Dats make this beautiful book of, it's double-sided of two of two of the circuit camera pieces. To date, this is the longest exposure I've made. It's 84 hours, and I, this is the longest piece I've ever made, and nobody wanted to frame it. <laughs> <laughs> and so it sat in my home for a long time, and when sang -yon came to visit my studio uh, and offer me an exhibition, in, in Korea, uh, I, I was surprised that she wanted all the circuit stuff. And, uh, and when she told me she wanted to use this piece, I didn't really understand. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very grateful that this installation transformed the work. And um, 
the, j just the curve of the wall mimicking the, the spinning of the camera. So nice. It now makes me want to dust off that camera and take it to the Galapagos Islands again on the equator so I can have one curve up onto the ceiling. <laughs> Strange cameras. Um, this is another body called Heliograph where I, I, I didn't go stick with the linear sun going one direction. I mixed it up. This is a sunset in the desert and uh, a sunset in the winter by the Canadian border on top of each other. This is called the heliograph, this work, and that literally means writing with light. So just think not so much about the landscape, but about the line. Cloudy day, clear day. Two clear days. You know, old Polaroid, where you peel? Uh, there's ten, 10 pictures in a pack, and I would expose frame one, burn through frame one, all the way to frame 10. And so just frame one got exposed, and then the lens burned to a point through, and then the heat caused color. And then I've gotten a little experimental. And it's all color, a lot of the color is just through heat. I included this one because this last frame reminds me of uh, these new uh, astronomy images from the James Webb Telescope. Uh, when I saw that, I thought of that. <laughs> and, um, and it... I, I thought that would be something really nice to end on as I, I feel like I'm photographing not uh, something beyond our time, beyond geologic time. It's more of like a universe time. Um, once we're all gone, that all these, all the sun is going to rise and set forever. And I'm just another person in a long history of people pointing things at the sun taking pictures of the sun. Thank you. <laughs>